The JFK 35 podcast is made possible through generous support from the Blanche and Irving Laurie Foundation. If an American, because his skin is dark, cannot enjoy the full and free life which all of us want, then who among us would be content to have the color of his skin changed and stand in his place? Who among us would then be content with the counsels of patience and delay? In 1963, President John F. Kennedy declared civil rights a moral issue and put the full weight of the presidency behind making sure states followed through on racial integration ordered by the courts. While President Kennedy didn't live long enough to see Congress pass the Civil Rights Act of 1964, his brother Robert would pick up where JFK left off. Today we'll talk with historian Patricia Sullivan about her new book on RFK and his role in the civil rights movement of the 1960s, next on JFK 35. And so my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. Hello, I'm Matt Porter. Welcome to JFK 35. The civil rights movement was in full swing in the early 1960s, just as President John F. Kennedy was taking office. Attorney General Robert Kennedy and his Department of Justice's Civil Rights Division devoted their energies to bringing civil rights cases against states refusing to comply with court orders to integrate schools, government offices, and other public spaces. Both Kennedys would be pressured by passionate black activists lobbying them to act. Those same activists were also taking the fight to the streets of southern cities like Selma and Birmingham, Alabama. Today I'm joined by historian Patricia Sullivan, who wrote a new book taking a closer look at Robert F. Kennedy and the civil rights movement before he was assassinated on the campaign trail in 1968. The book is called Justice Rising, Robert F. Kennedy's America in Black and White. Patricia, thank you for joining me. Oh, a pleasure to be with you, Matt. Thank you. So, Patricia, reading this book, what made you decide to write this book on this topic at this time? Well, um, it's, I didn't set out to write a book. Initially, I'm Robert Kennedy. I'm a historian of African-American history and civil rights, my freedom movements of the 20th century. I just finished a major book on the NACP, which expands from the early 20th century up to the 1950s. And so I was curious about taking a fresh look at the 60s. We tend to focus on a Southern-based civil rights movement when throughout the country, you know, the problems of racial inequality and racial discrimination really heightened through the 1950s as African-Americans migrated, continued to migrate north. So I was reading around and thinking, and, and Robert Kennedy's name came up a few times in particular instances. And I was curious, so I, I read more and I, realized that the Kennedy administration and Robert Kennedy in particular were much more deeply engaged with the country's challenges, racial challenges and, and the civil rights uh, struggles of this period than I had realized. And I think than, than most historians have acknowledged. So that was sort of the opening. And so in doing the book, I came to a different kind of understanding of the significance of the Kennedy administration while at the same time looking at the 60s through, through a fresh context. You, you say that, you know, President Kennedy and uh, his brother had, you know, a unique understanding of what was going on. Do you think that happened all at once? Or, you know, with both of them having grown up in Boston, a community where there were few black people around, you know, before the presidency, before they were in the White House, I think, you know, they had limited travels in the South. Do you think they went into their jobs with some inexperience, though, uh, and then they grew to understand the challenge with the jobs they took? Well, I, th I think their backgrounds, I think you know, they were well educated in, in the liberal arts. They were confident. They were uh, sort of well traveled. And then their trips to Southeast Asia in the early 1950s. So they were exposed to a lot. And, and a curious thing about President Kennedy's campaign, which I, I've sort of rethought in light of how he comes into the presidency with, with an understanding that's quite, I think, remarkable, is that you know he visited every state in the union uh, in his lead up to uh, his presidential run uh, in 1960. So they were exposed. He was exposed to um, you know what's happening throughout the nation, not just the South. And I just think that he saw things, you know. And of course, the sit-ins occurred during the in 1960. So the black vote because of the migration 
you know, nearly half of African Americans lived in, in the North and the West by 1960. And the Black vote had become a pivotal force, a pivotal factor for the Democratic uh, Party and in national elections. So I think there were political issues that, that drew attention. But, but again, I think the depth of his understanding, and, and really what proved me into that, uh, was an interview that Thurgood Marshall did with the Kennedy Library in 1964 about a meeting he had with John Kennedy in April of 1960 while he was a candidate. And JFK initiated the meeting, asked Marshall to come to his Senate office. Uh, they had lunch and Marshall said, I ended up staying. And what, what Thurgood Marshall concluded is that that he understood everything about, about the challenges in the South, around school desegregation and voting rights and that he had a commitment to civil rights and equality. Marshall really felt that as a result of that meeting in 1960. So that's an indication of he's at a point by the time he becomes president that he is uh, aware. And, and one other thing that I would mention that is also significant is when he decides to appoint his brother attorney general, there's a meeting in December of 1960 after the election and uh, Robert Kennedy's not particularly interested in a, a position in the administration. And John Kennedy wants him as his attorney general. And John said meeting, Siegenthaler was from Nashville, he's a Southerner, liberal on civil rights. Uh, he described the discussion and where John Kennedy said, I, you know, you know, civil rights is going to be a big issue. And I need someone in the Justice Department who I can trust, who's, who's going to be strong, who's going to join me in taking the risks. And according to Siegenthaler, John Kennedy said, we're going to have to change the climate in this country which was so true. So from the, from the beginning, even before the inauguration, this was on his mind and selecting his brother was brilliant because Robert Kennedy really fulfilled what John Kennedy uh, felt he needed in an attorney general uh, in the early 60s. Yeah, you know, once they were in office, you know, and RK and President Kennedy were seeing the freedom rides and sort of, you know, the violence that was going on in the deep South against those demonstrators or at the First Baptist Church. Yeah, I, I think I read, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I thought I read that sort of our Robert Kennedy sort of realized that this was going to be more than just a legal, a, an issue of laws to fix, um, that these issues were ingrained um, in a way that were that went far deeper than, you know, just to, to try to make this a legal problem, that this was became a moral problem. Well, I think that the freedom rights definitely were, were a major turning point. That point of, you know, Kennedy saying we need to change the climate in this country. That's more than laws. I mean, that, mm -hmm. that, that this, you know, the problem of race was deeply embedded, racial discrimination. I think there was an understanding of that. What the freedom rights revealed <laughs> is that the people who had supported his, his nomination, like Governor Patterson in Alabama, uh, that there was a complete breakdown of law, that, that the governor, from the governor on down, they were not going to protect the citizens who were really exercising their rights based on a Supreme Court ruling, and they weren't going to help the Kennedys out. You know, they were going to, and, and Robert Kennedy, after the, after the terrible uh, situation at the church where the, there were riots and, and it was a fear that they burned it out and inside to uh, celebrate the freedom rights, Robert Kennedy said, those fellows are at war with this country. So I think they understood this is spring of 61, right? He's in, in office for four months that uh, they were up against, you know, what they were up against in terms of Southern uh, political officials and, uh, and governors and the rest. Uh, they are at war with this country. And so what it would take, and you're right, more than changing the law, but even getting to change the law dealing with Southern Democrats, but they understood, yes, and even more so uh, that this problem was, was deeper than uh, just enacting the law. Let's talk about that speech on June 11th, 1963, the national televised address John F. Kennedy would give, basically throwing full support behind integration and the federal government's commitment to ending segregation, which he says to the nation um, as a moral issue for their time. How do you describe how they led up to that? How they went from when they first went office to getting to that point where they ultimately decided, you know, President Kennedy needs to go on TV and make this national address. And and who else was pushing them to do that? Well, uh, yeah, as you point out, that speech on June 11th is really a, a remarkable document, which I urge all of you to listen to. It really is quite striking. Uh, this is a culmination of two and a half years. He's been in office for not even two and a half years, 
or barely. And what they realized when he came in, we had a very slim majority of, of Democrats in Congress and, and Southern Democrats had the power of running committees that, you know, get, passing a strong civil rights act, defeating a filibuster was a steep climb. And so initially executive orders, uh, trying to enforce voting rights laws was the route they took looking for openings. And in 1962, uh, the president introduced a voting a civil rights act that would have uh, abolished, would have voting rights and really enhanced voting rights, filibustered, you know, so it really, uh, to get something that was strong enough to do the work that needed to be done. And of course, what happens is in the spring of 1963, Dr. King is in Birmingham orchestrating demonstrations to integrate the department stores and massive confrontation with Bull Connor, who turns fire hoses and dogs on young protesters, national attention and television and newspapers across the world. And the Kennedy sees this as an opportunity as well as a crisis. I mean, because protests break out across the country. And so the lid has come off, but they see this as an opportunity. The country is finally seeing and realizing that again, it, it's uh, a crisis moment because people, patience has run out among African-Americans across the country. Um, but hoping that this is a time that they can get enough support, bipartisan, to get through a strong civil rights bill. And it's quite uh, dramatic. And, and at that moment, it, your question about where was the pressure, the Justice Department, RFK's Justice Department was ready to move, Robert Kennedy was ready to move, the president was ready to move, none of his advisors thought it was a good idea. Uh, Vice President Johnson didn't think they could get a strong bill through and pass a filibuster. So really, it was Kennedy brothers and these Justice Department lawyers working on this issue for two and a half years. And how they're going to do it is they need Republicans, Republicans to be able to uh, defeat a filibuster, which was guaranteed. And they put that together. I mean, the speech is June 11th. And in June, the bill is introduced at the end of June. Uh, it's written at the end of May. I mean, it's very speeded up. Uh, they're working with William McCullough, uh, Republican Party uh, leader in Congress, and they really put together this, you know, this support. But it's fraught. <laughs> you know, it's, it's very challenging. And at the same time, and I think this is really significant, President Kennedy uh, begins bringing groups of citizens in, lawyers in one group, religious leaders, women's groups, start urging and mobilizing people to help build public support and public pressure uh, for uh, a strong civil rights bill. So it's really a, a remarkable summer of activity and energy that ultimately is successful in, uh, in, in getting this bill together. And by the time President Kennedy leaves for Dallas, the bill has, passed, has been voted out of the House Judiciary Committee and is on its way. Fast forwarding um, to 1968, April 4th, Martin Luther King is assassinated. We know RFK finds out um, about it during his campaign stop. He ends up giving a speech to a crowd in Indianapolis, many of them finding out for the first time that Dr. King was assassinated. How would you describe that moment um, with the civil rights movement that was still pushing forward on other issues now? You know, they had secured voting rights, but they were marching now for social rights, economic rights. What was that moment like for the crowd and RFK when they lost a leader like Dr. King? Uh, boy, but well, this is, you know, when you, it's just you know, five years after what we were just talking about, but it, it, it's, it's a really, a lot happens between um, 1963 and 1968. And one of the major shifts is that, you know, the, the problems and the discrimination, racial inequities in, in cities uh, leads to massive protests and, and urban rebellions that start in 1964 in Harlem and Rochester and Philadelphia, Watts in 65. And, you know, Dr. King goes to Chicago during this period to begin to try to help uh, address really deep problems of housing and police uh, abuses. Robert Kennedy's also paying it, working on that and focused on that and the issues of poverty. So by 68, the issues have broadened out and, and really deal with a lot of the structural and systemic issues that have a deep history in our, in our country. And so you point out that the loss of Dr. King at this moment was just uh, really devastating and all of that. 
And as you point out, Robert Kennedy was running uh, in the Indiana primary. He had declared his candidacy about a month earlier, or several weeks earlier. And he, he was, he's on his way to Indianapolis uh, for Muncie when he hears that Dr. King has been shot. And then when he lands in Indianapolis, he finds out that uh, he had, had died in Memphis from a gunshot wound. And there's a campaign that John Lewis has organized a rally in African-American community in Indianapolis. And it's, they're late getting there, it's nighttime. Police chief tells Robert Kennedy not to go, it's dangerous, and he insists on going. You know, it's hard for us to realize that before cell phones and all the rest, there were people in this park, crowded into this park, who had not heard that Dr. King had been shot. Um, so Robert Kennedy is the person uh, to break the news uh, to this crowd, which is mostly African-American. And it's it's really a, a stunning moment. He doesn't have a written speech. He, he tells them what happened. And then he talks to them about what Dr. King represented and, and, and really about the tragedy of the moment and, and, and the challenges to the country. And he really taps, you know, tries to evoke King's spirit to uh, help people uh, have the strength to, to go forward um, peacefully. And it's, um, it, it's, it's quite something. Uh, and, and that was one of, the, one of the moments that really drew me to Robert Kennedy as a subject for uh, this book. You mentioned he has to talk to this crowd, which is mostly African-American, mostly a black crowd, tell them that their leader, Dr. Martin Luther King, has passed. To me, it kind of embodies sort of what Robert F. Kennedy is able to do during his entire career, particularly his later post-1964. And he's successful as a white, Irish, Boston born um, guy and he's able to connect that night with a crowd who has vastly different life experiences than his own what was special about robert of kennedy that he was able to really reach across these very distinct divides well i mean that's uh you know really what the whole book looks at i mean th th there are it's a terrific question i mean he, he's a certain kind of person he's certain experiences growing up that i think makes him open to his moment in, in history that is moving into He's someone who was sensitive, curious, uh, asked questions, and went. I mean, Marion Wright Edelman had a great uh, way of describing Robert Kennedy. He went, he saw, he listened, he grew. And he had tremendous empathy for our community, be it in Appalachia, Mississippi Delta, or in uh, Bedford-Stuyvesant, and, and, and really see that the, the lives of young people, that, that you know, in, in a country like America, with such wealth and, and, and um, abundance to see people just, uh, you know, desperate poverty, poor schooling. And he, he felt it, you know, he, he felt it, but he saw it. He talked to people and, and he came to understand, you know, the deep inequities in our society. And also he's someone who believed in the capacity of Americans to face these challenges and work change them. And again, it's a trait that you see in him as a younger person, but as he becomes more exposed and travels around the country and sees things and really has such a commitment uh, to making this country better. But he was really, really shocked and, and horrified by the depths of the poverty and the consequences of the deep, you know, segregation that had grown up in cities around the, around the country, as well as um, the poverty and, and, and segregation in the South in the context of what is coming forward in this country through the civil rights movement and the de demands that are being made and, and really forcing the country to pay attention and look at um, the problems of racial inequality and of poverty uh, as well. In your book, you talk about a minority of Congress using the filibuster in the 1960s to prevent any further civil rights legislation. You could say they were even weaponizing the filibuster. Today, if we if I didn't know I was talking about the 1960s, you could almost easily say we're talking about what's going on in Congress today. How how do you reflect on, you know, the situation with voting rights today versus then? And what kind of um, leadership can we learn from your book to apply it for the leaders who are combating the same issue today? Wonderful question. Um, you know, one of the major figures in my book is Robert Moses, Bob Moses, who went into Mississippi and, and was a central organizer of the voting rights push in that state, the most segregated and violent state. 
in the country. And, and as you study this history, it, that applies to today, that no, nothing's won, nothing's settled. You know, you, you struggle to, 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 to change things, to really uh, secure justice and, and voting rights. And, and it, you have to stay vigilant. And because, uh, you know, the, the, the way it, it works, I mean, there are, uh, and as we see what's happened now, it's, you know, Republicans want to limit voting to, to sustain power and, you know, democracy sort of be damned. And it really, I, I think what um, we learned from this, this earlier period is that it takes effort at all levels, you know, seeing the problem. And I think it's been, you know, exposed and we understand, but then the organizing, the, the um, pressure, uh, and long term, long haul, you know, there, there, there's no quick fix. I mean, it's really getting in there and fighting to hold on to these rights and to secure what we're, we've lost. I mean, Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, you know, pre-clearance. And, you know, there's tremendous energy in the country today at, at the local grassroots level and organizations. And But really, we need to kind of uh, sustain that and, and, and amplify it. And, you know, listen for public leaders like, uh, you know, Robert Kennedy and, and, and that. But, but, you know, they really were dependent on their efforts built on the movement, you know, what, what the civil rights movement had opened up. And I think, you know, it's an issue. Voting rights is something that every American should be concerned about and, and access to voting rights. So really getting the information out, educating uh, citizens and, and building uh, the momentum to... Uh, to change it because it is it is shocking to realize the ground that that's been lost uh, in recent years on this issue. And you mentioned John Lewis. You know, people literally gave their lives to secure voting rights, and they succeeded. They succeeded in getting that Voting Rights Act and uh, running enfranchisement. So I think uh, we're in a very we're in a very right now, uh, and we've been there before. And what it's taken is really activism and commitment across the board, and really helping to bring fellow citizens along, you know, educating people and it's, you know, really making the issue something that that is of concern to more and more Americans in a way that can get the kind of legislation that we need in Congress. Do you think it's also different today that, you know, back in the 60s, you know, the African-American movement really depended on getting, you know, good white people like Robert F. Kennedy, who had political power to line up on their side today you know we have people in congress who represent these populations mm-hmm. you know we have from alexandra ocasio cortez stacy abrams ilhan omar uh ayana presley here in boston what kind of difference do you think that makes that unlike last time they have more political power themselves well in the end you know there are certain ways you get a bill passed in this country and i think it's terrific the representation uh, we have terrific uh, people in Congress. And, uh, and and as you point out, thanks to the Voting Rights Act and the change in the 60s, we have representation for you know, African-Americans and communities uh, across the board in terms of um, these progressive efforts. And at the same time, you know, back in the 60s, if you look at the Congress that passed the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act, there, there were people who were concerned about this issue, but you had to build coalition. You had to work within the you know, within the structures, but stretch them. You know, it's a tough, and you have to mobilize pressure from outside as well. And, uh, you know, I, I think, so I, I think the people you mentioned in Congress, that's a huge plus. And, and, and they have visibility, people have access, but, you know, our media is so, is so segmented now that how do we get messages across to everyone, you know, and not just uh, talking to our base and the people who agree with us, but to really, for citizens, it matters to them, I mean, that's the challenge today. It's great to have social media. It's great to be able to connect. But how do we connect the boss, you know, to, to, to emphasize, to reach people who need to know that voting rights is fundamental to American democracy and American citizenship. So having the great leadership in place is, is important. But then finding in this moment how we do what was done in the 1960s for movement activists and people like Robert Kennedy how do we build the momentum and, and bring, inform people and energize people who, who may not be concerned or know, you know, I mean, the historic literacy, but it, you don't even have to know history. You need to understand about the, the right to vote and, and, and the, the danger to American democracy 
by so boldly limiting and denying voting rights through various measures that have been used. And of course, the legislation before Congress have really helped remedy that. So how do you think the challenge is to get the support on elected officials, I mean, people in Congress to work with these advocates of voting rights, working hard for it to, to really be able to get something that can, again, defeat the filibuster, change the filibuster. But again, you've got to, wanting to change is one thing, being able to do it is takes tremendous uh, effort and uh, work. Yeah. But, uh, but I am encouraged that we have many people uh, in political leadership and in activism and organizations that are committed to carrying this forward. You have to stay the course and it's, it's, it takes um, tremendous effort and collaboration and, and, and at some point certain compromises, but also always keeping it moving forward. I think that's a perfect place to end, Patricia. Thank you so much for joining us and telling us a little bit about um, your new book. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Great to talk with you. Throughout their political careers, both Kennedy brothers met with key figures in the civil rights movement. That included both those who worked on the front lines of the protest movement and others who worked in the courts to end legal segregation. One figure that they were introduced to was Thurgood Marshall, a lawyer for the NAACP who was known as Mr. Civil Rights. My colleague Jamie Richardson tells us how the Kennedy administration was convinced to nominate him to the federal bench, from where he would eventually land a seat on the Supreme Court. In the interview with Patricia Sullivan, she mentioned a meeting John F. Kennedy had with Thurgood Marshall in the spring of 1960. Though he wouldn't become the first black Supreme Court justice until 1967, Marshall was a prominent lawyer with the NAACP when JFK met with him. He had argued cases of racial discrimination in front of the Supreme Court, and perhaps most notably was the architect behind the strategy that led to the 1954 Brown v. Board of Education decision, which ruled that segregated public schools were unconstitutional. Once in the White House, President Kennedy and Attorney General Robert Kennedy looked to appoint African-American judges to positions on the federal bench. In his oral history for the JFK Library, Lewis Martin, advisor to the Kennedys and called the godfather of black politics, recalled a general consensus on Thurgood Marshall at that time. Thurgood Marshall uh, was not at that moment in the early days uh, the number one guy in the thoughts of most people. One of the reasons is Thurgood was uh, the leader of the civil rights movement at that point, and uh, there was some doubt because of the climate of the that mm -hmm. he could get uh, enough support. Nevertheless, Martin was able to convince RFK to offer Marshall a judgeship in a district court, but Marshall turned that down. But he later expressed interest in a position on a higher court, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit. On September 23, 1961, the Kennedy administration submitted Thurgood Marshall as their nominee for the vacant position on the Court of Appeals. The White House received mail protesting the nomination, some worrying how a pro-integrationist would serve on a federal court. For eight months, the subcommittee charged with holding Marshall's confirmation hearings did nothing. The White House received mail from supporters of Marshall's appointment, decrying the subcommittee's inaction, noting that it was led by Southern segregationists. On August 22, 1962, nearly a year since the president's nomination, Kennedy was asked about the delay in Marshall's confirmation. President, yeah. President it's been almost a year since you nominated Thurgood Marshall for the federal bench. Senator Keating of New York charges that the subcommittee during his nomination is delaying it by ridiculous and unlawyer-like questions. Do you share the senator's view of the holdup on his confirmation? I think it's been much too much delayed. Uh, I'm confident, uh, in fact, I'm sure that the Senate will not adjourn, and I've been given those assurances that the Senate will not adjourn without action being taken by the United States Senate on the Thurgood Marshall appointment. When it does come for a vote, and it will, and in my judgment, uh, the Senate will confirm him overwhelmingly. Finally, in September 1962, Thurgood Marshall was confirmed as judge for the Court of Appeals, where he served for four years. In 1967, he would face yet another confirmation battle when he was nominated for the Supreme Court. Jamie, thank you for that look at Thurgood Marshall's path to becoming a federal judge. There are a lot more details on what Marshall himself called the long siege to be confirmed for the Court of Appeals. 
go to the show page at jfklibrary.org slash jfk35 for links to a blog post written by archivist Stacey Chandler and the oral history interviews referenced here and in the interview with Patricia Sullivan. Really interesting. I hope viewers can look into those resources on our page. And thank you for listening to this episode of JFK 35, a podcast from the JFK Library Foundation. If you have questions or story ideas, email us at jfk35pod at jfklfoundation.org or tweet at us at JFK Library using the hashtag JFK35. If you liked what you heard today, please consider subscribing to our podcast or leaving us a review wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening and have a great week. Thank you.